Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is Javed Mirza. He's the technical analyst at Canaccord Genuity in Toronto. We're going to take a long-term view of the equity markets. You know, the S&P at or near all-time highs, but that's been that way for a couple of months now, I feel like, right? If you look at what the S&P has done, a friend of mine, Tony Dwyer, called this a power on stall. The market is going up, but it's stalling. We're going sideways. The S&P distributing into the close today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets themselves. We focus on the charts. Uh, I was taught early in my career that uh, charts visualizing investor behavior using price and breadth and momentum, trend, all the things that we talk about on the show is the best way to understand uh, crowd psychology. Uh, I studied psychology as an undergraduate and uh, and was uh, fascinated by the fact that there's a toolkit that helped you quantify what investors were thinking and feeling and how they were voting with their capital. And uh, hopefully on this show, uh, as we uh, go on every day, we're able to share with you some of the ways that uh, that you can apply some of those lessons in your own analysis. We have fantastic guests on the show, by the way. I'm super excited to talk with uh, Javed again. He's been on the show before. Uh, always brings some really good charts. Uh, and today, a little more of a long-term view, which is going to be a lot of fun to think through. Uh, coming up on the show tomorrow on the 10th, we have Sam Burns from Mill Street Research in Boston. Coming up next weekend on Tuesday the 15th, we have David Hunter joining the, the show for the first time. And then on Wednesday the 16th, Chris Shivako from Shivako Capital in Atlanta. Also, as a reminder, I'll be doing a webcast on uh, next Tuesday, June 15th, one o'clock Eastern called Demystifying Fibonacci. If you've ever tried to use Fibonacci retracements or projections, you've heard people talk about 38.2% or 61.8%, and you've never really been able to figure out how to apply them with any sort of consistency or profitability. Hopefully our time together will help address that. Go to marketmisbehavior.com slash Fibonacci. If you'd like, uh, if you're interested in that, it's a free event. I look forward to seeing you there. Let's continue on with our market recap today. As I mentioned, you know, uh, I was interviewed for NASDAQ trade talks earlier today and was talking with uh, Jill Melodrino, the host. And, uh, you know, we were talking about just the uh, the NASDAQ, the S&P are sort of in a stall mode. And I, I always appreciate when we can apply some aviation terminology to the markets. And uh, as I mentioned in the intro, Tony Dwyer, uh, and I'm mentioning Tony because he's also at uh, Canaccord Genuity uh, based in uh, the New York area. Uh, you know, he and I, had a, have a mutual interest in flying. He followed way beyond what I did, got his private license, got his uh, uh, other uh, other uh, uh, checks and uh, and has a plane that's uh, it's pretty pretty cool. Uh, but we love to compare notes about aviation, how it relates to the markets. He described this current market as a power on stall, which is basically the 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 the, the aircraft is going higher, the market is going higher, and then it just kind of stops going up. And it's because of the angle and what you're doing with the plane, but the market's sort of you know, in an unsustainable climb. It's sort of continued to climb. But then if you look at the recent history, look at the last six to eight weeks, uh, really since the, you know, March, April uh, sort of period, you can see we've sort of stabilized, right? The, the things aren't bad. There are some things breaking down. Things like John Deere come to mind. Now, there are things testing supports, charts like Apple and Tesla and others that are at the lower end of a range. But there are also stocks doing just fine, like Facebook and Alphabet, uh, and uh, plenty of the banks, uh, real estate going to new all-time highs. And this is how that nets out into an, an S&P essentially going sideways. You know, it's always interesting to look at the last hour of trading. I can't help but notice that in the last two trading days on the 8th, on Tuesday, today, Wednesday, the 9th, you have distribution from 3 p.m. Eastern on. Uh, usually more distributive of a sign uh, showing you that at the end of the day, which is when institutions are tending to make their moves, it's more uh, on the on the sell side than the buy side. Uh, it's more distributive than accumulative, uh, accumulative, and uh, and indicating uh, maybe a bearish bias there. Uh, and this is after you know much of the day the S and P was essentially uh, you know flat to positive, but finished 
negative. So the S&P closing at 42.20, that's down 0.2%. The NASDAQ 100 actually just above the zero line, the NASDAQ composite a bit below. Mid caps and small caps continuing to push to the downside. We'll talk about that relative strength of small caps. Uh, and again, a lot of that ends up being the sector uh, weighting. So uh, you know, bond prices breaking out, interest rates really getting down and threatening the one one and a half percent level, which is a key support level, I would argue. And so, financial stocks uh, coming off today, industrials uh, and materials as well. All the the cyclical sectors really feeling uh, heavy today. Looking at other asset classes very quickly, as I mentioned, uh, ten year yields below one and a half percent now for the first time in quite a while. That level is one we've talked about. We've been getting near to it, and I think we're now pushing below it. And so. You know, having a, a, a set of conditions with bond prices appreciating uh, is a little different. We've had bond prices in a downturn for quite a while. We've had rates going higher. Now you have potentially rates breaking down and, and going lower. What does that mean for the financial sector? It tends to be pretty negative. Uh, it's more of a headwind. What does that mean for growth stocks? It tends to be more of a tailwind. And you'll notice, by the way, some of the questions I've gotten recently are about you know, how come banks do this, but interest rates are doing this? Or how come gold is doing this because something else is doing this? And I, I would caution you anytime from making one in one direct correlations. There is a general relationship. Yes, when bonds do X, when interest rates do Y, financial stocks tend to do Z like that. There are things you can describe, but they are not 100% consistent. That's why you hear me describe them as tailwinds and headwinds, which funny is uh, is another aviation set of aviation terms, but you know it, it doesn't mean that when you're flying into a headwind you can't make progress. It doesn't mean when you have a tailwind that you can't also slow down. It's just the tendency. You are much better positioned. You are much more likely to outperform when there's a tailwind and underperform when there's a headwind. And that's how I think of things like lower rates. Lower rates tend to be a headwind for financials. Financial stocks can go up and can outperform with rates going down. It's happened before, but it's more likely that financial stocks are going to struggle. So don't think of it in absolutes. I'd encourage you to think of it more in probabilities. And I tend to think of it as in headwinds and tailwinds. Just gives you a sense of the overall bias. Bond prices, and I mentioned up, and we talked about the TLT 140 level, which we closed above yesterday, really following through to the upside. And I think we're in a, a situation here where uh, bond prices could be going higher. We'll uh, we'll have to look at the chart here in a bit. The dollar essentially flat for the day using the UUP. Precious metals ended up being uh, mixed for the day. Uh, gold uh, below, silver uh, a little bit above. Commodities as a whole a little heavier. And energy stocks were down about 0.6% on weaker oil prices. Plenty of volatility continuing uh, in the uh, in the cryptocurrency space. Bitcoin currently up about 8.4%. Uh, from where uh, we ended the day yesterday, it had touched thirty-one thousand about uh, in the last, you know, twenty-four hours or so, but now back up above thirty-six thousand. So again, plenty of plenty of potential movement. I still think the the path of least resistance is down until proven otherwise with um, some of those cryptos. But days like this show you the volatility that you're going uh, that you're faced with looking at those markets. Very quickly, the number one sector, healthcare. Now you saw Biogen with the jump higher with uh, news earlier in the week, continuing to actually push to the upside after that. Uh, after that upside surprise, which is impressive. Utilities number two, which is a very defensive play followed by re real estate. The utility sector has been underperforming for quite a while. So interesting to see it at the top. But this is in general sort of a defensive uh, and defensive stocks outperforming the cyclical stocks, the leadership we've been talking about, the um, infrastructure play, the basic materials, energy, all underperforming today and, uh, and, and way pretty heavy. And, and essentially the growth trade kind of in the middle, right? You have consumer discretionary down, technology essentially uh, flat for the day. Let's quickly look at a chart of the S&P uh, 500 here. And again, no real change on this chart this week so far. If you look at Friday's close, which is the move and retesting the closing high from early May, we've basically gone nowhere for the last three trading days. If you're short-term oriented, it may be worth pointing out the fact that every one of the days this week we've closed below the open on the S&P uh, might be an interesting thing to, uh, to continue to pay attention to. We're not really closing in a position of strength like we did uh, on Friday's close. This week has been about distribution, especially in the last hour of the day. Uh, so it tells you a little bit about when I, when I think about a market stalling, those are the kind of short-term signals that would sort of corroborate that uh, overall thesis. You know, if we do pull back at all here, you sort of start to have a confluence of support. The low from last week, sort of that blip pullback day, first week in June, just around 41.55, 41.60. That's right where the 50-day the, uh, moving average is. Also a trend line, which I should probably extend from the October low to the March low um, to the May lows. Why don't we do it right now before we think of anything else to talk about? So I'm just going to extend this trend line. I like to keep the trend lines uh, updated just so I remember 
uh, treat the uh, the charts as a workbook, not as a as a painting. So if you look, you have this confluence of support, the trend line support, the 50 day moving average, the low from last week, all kind of in the same point. That would be the first line of defense, the first line in the sand, as long as we stay above that. Uh, there's no real issue with this market yet. And I think the the confirmation would be a close below 4050. That would take us below um, the uh, the May low. You know, as I mentioned, I was on NASDAQ uh, trade talks earlier. This is one of the charts we looked at, which was the NASDAQ 100. And, you know, it's it's interesting. If you look, the rally into the February high, while the S&P really made a, uh, has attempted to make higher pushes, and NASDAQ really has continued to just find resistance at or just below 14,000. This is now the third time we've approached those levels. Uh, the first time we sold off about 12% on the NASDAQ. The second time here into early May, it was down about 7 or 8%, if I remember right to 13,000, it'd be very interesting if we have a similar sort of pullback range. That would put us back in the 12,5 to 13,000 range, which would be right around the 200 day moving average. It's worth noting that every push higher has seen lower momentum. And that's sort of a uh, concerning pattern. Again, it's more indicative of, a, of an uptrend that's stalling, not an uptrend that's in a position of strength uh, moving higher. You know, uh, during the week, I tend to run 13 week high and 13 week low screens. These are stocks breaking to a new three month high, stocks breaking to a new three month low. And, you know, it's a starting point for me and it's not a, an ending point. So it's not like I do anything with that list in particular, besides we'll review those charts and see what's actionable. And I'm struck by charts like Deer um, that have been really solid charts. This is a stock that has been a consistent outperformer for much of the last year, really starting not necessarily at the Marshall, but really the June market peak and the pullback. You saw this rotation higher trading above the 50 day moving average bouncing off of that in uh, the end of April, uh, failing now below it uh, and retesting that support level as resistance from uh, below and now making a new swing low. That's a chart that's really starting to rotate down to the downside. You see starting to underperform the RSI getting below 40. That's no longer a chart that's in a uh, pretty classic uptrend. It's showing more signs of distribution. A market tops when you see not just deer doing this and you only had, I think, four or five stocks out of my universe making a new three-month low today. You need to see more and more charts start to look like this. That would be the glaring sell signal you may be waiting for not happening yet. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with my guest, Javin Mercer. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we try to make sense of these markets using charts, using the power of StockCharts.com and uh, technical analysis, all the tools that we can uh, bring to bear to understand things. As a reminder, we'll do another mailbag segment on Friday's show. We would love to hear from you and answer one of your questions on the air. We can read your questions in one of three ways. Number one, via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. Number two on Twitter, just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV. Finally, on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you. Hope to answer one of your questions on Friday's show. Also, as a reminder, go to stockchartstv.com. Use your email, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our great content on demand on that website and also on all of the app stores. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on my guest who's been on the show a number of times, always does a fantastic job. And I'm, I'm humbled to bring people like Javed on who I feel like can use stock charts a little better than I can, because I always get ideas just how he's presenting his work using our platform. Javed Mirza, welcome back to the show. Hey, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. So chart number one is a pretty long-term chart. We're going back to the deep history of the S&P 500 here. Talk us through what this is telling you. Yeah, so what this is, is it's funny, um, and I've actually, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out a, a way to say this tactfully, is that technicals are fungible, so they're like fractals. So the reason that's important is because, Dave, when you're looking at, like, shorter-term time frames, you can use the, apply the same technical methodology that you apply to long-term time frame. So it, 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 it's just funny 
because they're they're you know I, I've worked with people before in the past who who uh, you know view some somehow view technicals as purely for shorter term when it, it, it's very clear that they can be used for long term trends uh, as well. So what I have here in front of you is the long term chart of the S and P 500, and and you and I we've talked about this before is that those blue lines there represent long-term trends. So these are secular bull markets, exactly, that, what you're highlighting there perfectly. And they typically last, you know, 20 to 25 years. And it, it's funny because, you know, some people view technicals, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, as voodoo, but all technicals is doing, and it, it drew me in the exact same way you did, and I love the, the story you're telling. It's just human psychology and emotion um, and, you know, Buffett has that quote uh, of uh, voting versus, uh, you know, in the short term and a weighing the market as a weighing mechanism in the long term. And what we're doing here is just identifying these secular bull markets. But obviously, there's got to be something fundamentally underpinning these secular bull markets. So you can see, you know, from call it the 50s to, to the 60s. There is a transportation revolution. We're seeing things under happening in industrials and consumer discretionary. Those were the leaders. And then from 85 to call it 2000, we saw an electronic re revolution, uh, energy and telecommunication. They were big leaders there. Remember, th this is a time, especially towards the 90s and the beginning of the tech bubble there, where we started seeing all that infrastructure being built out. Now, what those red shaded boxes are is they highlight consolidation. So they highlight when all the developments have been kind of put in place and you kind of need to kind of work through everything. So the reason that late 90s were so exciting and Dave and you and I, we kind of lived through the excitement of this World Wide Web, uh, you know, descending upon us. But then it still took the next 10 years, that consolidation phase, for things to really shake out and develop. And then that fuels the next secular bull market because you're taking advantage of that consolidation where really it's refining all the, uh, I guess, developments and innovation that occurred. So the, the reason I'm kind of giving you this preamble is because everything here is set up quite nicely for a secular bull market that has legs out to 2030. And in our view, that the next uh, secular bull market that's underway is led by information technology and biotechnology. And it, it's funny, what I love about what we do is that there's intersections with other areas of life. And you know, with the pandemic, uh, you know, I did a lot of reading as I'm sure a lot of other people did as well. And one of the books I was recommended or one of the authors was Yuval Harari. And uh, uh, the book that I, I would recommend people take a look at is Homo Deus. And he just talks about the future and it aligns beautifully with what we're seeing in the charts. And so he talks about the future uh, is man's quest for immortality. So we're trying to increase our lifespan. We're trying to control our environment. You know, you, you hit a button on your phone and then a car will come to you that's driving by itself and it'll take you uh, wherever you want to go. So essentially we're kind of becoming uh, like gods, uh, if you will, through our mastery of, of technology and the environment. And then of course, we're trying to expand our, our lifespans and improve our, our lives. And as people saw, we just saw that Biogen announcement a couple of days ago, uh, which is fantastic. But the bottom line is right now, we're seeing a lot of innovation underway in information technology, biotechnology. And that really is a, a big driver um, of what's this secular bull market and what is underpinning it. And, and Dave, hopefully later on, uh, if we're able to, uh, we should take a look at XBI as well. I think that's a really interesting chart. Um, so that kind of explains this chart and, and what's going on. And you can see in the second panel, RSI remains strong. It's above the 50 line. And in the top panel, you can see price momentum is reaccelerating. And this is as of March 31st. This is pulled from our quarterly, but all these trends uh, remain uh, in place. And I think last time we chatted, uh, we were talking about uh, the cycle work with that we do and that we, you know, we, we should have upside through into May. And here we are in June and it actually looks like the market or at least certain areas of it, uh, especially the information technology and biotechnology that uh, we're, we're seeing that uh, rotation back into those names 
um, which my other charts, when I talk about yields, and as you alluded to, we'll, we'll talk about as well. And it's funny that you pull up that deer chart, because I think that's where the money is going to be coming from to, to fund uh, this next uh, reacceleration here and some of the growth things. So, Javed, we only have about 30 seconds left, but I do want to get to your chart of, uh, of interest rates, because obviously we've, we're seeing rates break down for a little bit here. And, and while the long term certainly looks constructive for stocks, which makes a ton of sense, what does this chart mean to you? in the short term and how you should be just a couple seconds if we could. Yeah, just really quickly. So uh, two versus 10 spread, as we talked about, uh, you know, really important for financials. And we're seeing a short term breakdown here, and especially the second panel. RSI was really strong from October to March, but now it's weakening. That to me says further weakness is coming. We could go all the way back to 118. And financials, to me, look like they're at risk here, and I think they could fund this rotation back into growth. And lower rates are positive for growth, as you alluded to earlier. That's a great take. Listen, I wish we could spend hours talking about these charts. These are fascinating, uh, Javed. Listen, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Be well, stay safe. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Perfect. Thanks so much, Dave. Likewise. That's Javed Mirza. Javed is the technical analyst at uh, Canaccord Genuity in Toronto. I love that first chart. Where we're talking about the long-term trends, and it's it's funny. It, it makes me think of uh, Alexander Elder, his book. Uh, I think it's called "Come Into My Trading Room." Um, boy, I should know that title off the top of my head. It, it's something that sounds a lot like that, if it's not exactly that. But uh, you know, in his introduction, he's talking about just the difference between trading and investing. And you know, his comments about investing is it's about being super patient, being able to look way down the road and think about how society is evolving, how economies are going to evolve and what's going to work, you know, what, what is going to make sense down the road, what's going to make sense to other people way later. And when uh, Jeff was talking about things like biotechnology and information technology, that strikes me as the sort of themes that, uh, that, uh, that Elder was talking about in his book. It's a great take on the long term, just a reminder of the long term appreciation in equities with some challenging periods along the way. Great take from Javed Marissa there. Let's go on to our next segment called Banking on Breadth. What we like to do with some occasion is review breadth indicators, focusing on some of the key signals that we can tease out. As a reminder, this uh, this chart list called Breadth Indicators is part of uh, what's called the morning coffee routine that's on uh, stockcharts.com. It's free for members. Uh, if you uh, are one and you'd like to access these charts along with all the other ones, most of the charts I show on the uh, on the show are part of that chart list or, or chart pack. Go to your dashboard. When you see your chart list, go to the very bottom. There's a gray button that says manage chart packs and you can get to this one along with many others. You know, we'll start with just looking at the uh, at the breadth by cap tier. And what I wanted to point it out here is that, um, uh, you know, that the, the, the S&P is, is, is not making a new high, but what is making a new high are all the breadth measures. So you look at the NYSE, the S&P 500, the mid cap index, the small cap index, these are all making new all-time highs in the last week. And, you know, I learned when I first learned about breadth, I was taught something along the lines of don't be bearish when all of these are breaking out. At the same time, don't be bullish when all of these start breaking down. And we're in the scenario where even though the S&P is sort of unable to push to new highs, when I hear Javed's sort of bullish thesis overall on, uh, on growth, I'm looking at this chart and I'm seeing that you know, the trend is still very much uh, positive. And you see that just on the normal day-to-day -day movement of stocks. This means when the accumula cumulative AD lines are going higher, that means over time, there are more advancers than decliners. So there are more stocks going up on a day than uh, going down. That's the sign of a healthy uh, healthy bull market. You know, it depends. We've had some, uh, you know, some, some mixed days recently. You really haven't had those huge, like 80 to 90% up days in quite a while, actually a month or so since the last, uh, uh, 80 plus percent down day, which was here in uh, the second week in May. Since then, it's really not been a huge update. And, that, and that's what maybe why this market feels so stalled is you don't have that day where it feels like just everything's going up and everything's positive. We keep having these mixed days where, you know, on a day like to this, 41% of uh, the S, or excuse me, the NYSE close positive, 57% uh, close negative. So, you know, while the S&P was okay and kind of held in there, more stocks than not were uh, were closing down on the day, which is uh, which is a bit of a, a concern. Same thing with the volume reading. You know, we've talked about some of the you know volume lightening up, and uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, my conversation with Craig Johnson last week. We talked a little bit about volume. Volume is not something I look at regularly. It's something I look at occasionally, along with other uh, indications. And and so this is looking at 
um, advancers versus decliners based on volume. So far this week, it's been about 50-50. It's not been a clear you know, signal that volume's on one side or the other. This is one chart, maybe in the breadth, uh, look, a lot of these seem pretty positive, but some of them a little more mixed, like the, the, the daily advanced decline reading. This is another one that's a little more, a little less positive is how I would describe it. This is the percent of S&P stocks above their 50-day moving average, uh, which keeps rolling over here. So, um, you know, we're, we, we bounced off of a level just above 60, 60%, it's about 65% here. Uh, the second week in May, that's when we pulled back to the 50-day moving average. So what's interesting is while the S&P did not close below its 50-day, uh, a number of stocks did. So here at the uh, the new high in early April, you had over about 93% of the S&P making a new high here in early mid-May, you had about 65%. So that's about 30% of stocks that had been above their 50-day that no longer are is basically what that means. And so this continued to slope downwards does not make me feel great. That's telling you that under the hood, even though the S&P index is hanging in there, there are plenty of stocks. While the S&P is staying above its 50-day, there are more and more stocks that are breaking down, um, especially if this goes lower. And absolutely looking at the 50% level is pretty, pretty key on this chart. That'll tell you in a pullback situation how concerned you may, uh, may need to be about that. You know, when I'm looking at new highs and, uh, and new lows, uh, you might not be able to tell it, but there is a little red histogram here that would indicate new lows in the S&P. Not many. This is new 52-week lows, and some, most stocks are so far away from their 52-week low. It's just not reasonable. You'd see a lot of them. So it's more about, do you see an expansion in new highs? Do you see more and more? And if you look at what we saw in March into April into early May, you saw this increasing uh, more and more stocks, and at the at the highest day when the S and P made a new all time high there, the first week in May, got about 40, 45 percent of the S and P making a new fifty two week high all in the same day. Now it's back to around ten or eleven percent, which is what it's been, uh, which is not bad. That's not saying that nothing's making a new high, but it's a lot less. It's not this increasing number that we've seen uh, before. So that might be something. Uh, I may want to may want to look at. So overall, we have to wrap for time. But when I'm thinking of breadth indicators, it goes from very bullish, which I would say the cumulative advanced decline. Though, there's nothing but positive signal from from there. But then when you get into some of the other uh, indicators, uh, it's a little more mixed, right? It's a little more measured, and I and and that's about what the S and P feels like, right? You're not getting this dramatic move to new highs. You're getting a, a stalled market. And that's what the uh, the indicators are going to show you. We need to wrap the show. Go to the three and three three charts. In three minutes, here we go. Chart number one, playing on that breadth theme. We talked in banking on breadth about the strength in uh, in breadth indications, the strength of cumulative advanced decline lines. But I was asked earlier, actually, I think this was on Friday, so I was asked about the cumulative advanced decline line for the NASDAQ, which is what I put here. So here's the cumulative advanced decline line for the NYSE, cumulative advanced decline line for the NASDAQ. The reason why I'm highlighting this, look at the February market peak. When the S&P made new highs, continued to make new highs April into May. Look at how the cumulative advanced decline line on the NYSE continues to trend upwards as well. Look at how the NASDAQ actually still has not made it above the high that it made in February. And it shows you how it's not been growth that's really been the juice in the last couple months. It's been more of the cyclicals. And, and given the weakness in rates that uh, Javed highlighted, I think is absolutely right, uh, certainly would be more of a tailwind for this bottom advanced decline line, the NASDAQ. Uh, be interesting to see if it's able to make it above the uh, February peak. Uh, we talked about interest rates breaking down, the two versus 10 year spread breaking down. That was one of our three and three charts yesterday. Flip those over and you have the chart of the TLT, which is bond prices. We've talked about the 140 level that had been broken yesterday, confirmed in a big way today. We're in a position of higher bond prices with the RSI getting above 60. We're in a position of lower rates with the uh, uh, 10 year yield breaking down with the twos, 10 spread breaking down. That is a major headwind for financials. And I think the trend that we've seen uh, for now is going to be uh, is going to be on pause. Uh, and, uh, and you look for signs of breakdowns. A lot of those stocks have had incredible runs. You could argue that they are very well overdue for a bit of a pullback. But that's sort of the mode that I'm seeing right now. I think financials you need to lean away from if you can. Finally, uh, highlighting stocks that are breaking down again, there's a, a value in my process of looking at stocks making new swing highs and new swing lows. I usually look at three month highs and three month lows on a group of stocks uh, and uh, ETFs as well, just to make sure I understand what's happening. One of the stocks that popped up is, uh, is John Deere, DE, which is obviously an industrial name, a mega cap stock. And it's a stock that we've talked about as an example of a resilient uptrend in the first quarter. Look at how that has gone sideways and now broken down, breaking down through the 50 day and making new relative lows as well. Folks, that's our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday. 
for the final bar. Special thank you to Javed Mercer joining us from Toronto. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.